the biggest health reform that the U.S. Uh, uh, the biggest health care uh, initiative the U.S. has ever had. Uh, it is arguably one of the biggest uh, in the world in terms of the, what we're attempting. It's not perfect. Uh, I think there's been a tremendous amount of noise out there uh, and very little uh, light. And today we're going to have some light. Whether or not you know, people at home are, are for or against, it's critical that you understand uh, the facts. And uh, usually what one finds uh, uh, out there are not the facts. Um, so today, uh, sponsored uh, uh, by the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center, uh, which is a unit here within the School of Public Health that works closely uh, with health officers and public health professionals around the state of Maryland, uh, and, and also, of course, Maryland uh, Citizens Health Initiative. Uh, we're going to have the second of what's been two educational programs targeted not just to the folks here on the Johns Hopkins uh, Medical Campus who've come from around the community, but also all of you uh, at home. I realize that many of you will be watching this live as we speak, and that's great. And by the way, I was asked to remind you, you can click on, there's an interaction uh, link there, and at any time, uh, they're really set up right here. There's a laptop right in the front uh, that any question you have at home or in the office will be given to our panelists. So please do that. Uh, likewise, uh, you can, some of you may be watching this on archive. I can't promise that we'll answer the questions after the fact. But if you have questions, please send them on to the Maryland Citizens Health Initiative. Uh, and there was an excellent presentation that gave an overview of the contours of health reform. That was last June, right? Uh, and that's available probably where you logged on. You'll find that on archive, and I'd encourage you to look at that. Uh, and likewise, today, uh, you, this will be saved. So tell your friends about it. Uh, this is going to be a fantastic session. Uh, and uh, you can tell them about it, and they can watch it at any time online, 24 hours a day. Uh, today, the focus will be, I like to say, sort of the first car in the freight train of health reform. Uh, this is, uh, again, going to be huge. Uh, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, either as uh, health care. Uh, all the problems we've had uh, over the years, of course, uh, being the uh, 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 one of the most, ex uh, the biggest, the most expensive, and the only one with over 50 million uninsured. Uh, and as we bring uh, most, unfortunately not all, but most of the uninsured on board, I estimate it's going to take us probably to the year 2020. So it's going to take a lot of time to do all the things that need to be done and, and undo all the bad things that have been done. So it's really critical we all pay attention and make that train run as well as it can, as efficiently as it can, you know, from, from the engine to the caboose. But it's also the designers of the program made sure that there was something good in the first uh, car on that freight train and hopefully the caboose as well. Uh, of course, many of you know the main provisions kick in in, in 2014. And uh, I, I've been hugely impressed at what the feds and uh, uh, every state, particularly our state, have been doing to try to really uh, get things uh, working as well as and efficiently as possible. But uh, some things have kicked in already, and many things are happening this year. And I believe that will be the focus um, of this conference, and we have a, a fantastic panel. But my job was, again, to welcome you, to set the stage, and then to introduce uh, Vinnie DeMarco, who generally needs no introduction. Uh, but Vinnie uh, is, uh, you know, of course, a, a huge leader in health uh, reform here in our state, and his official title, he has many, but his official title for today is the president of the Maryland Citizens Health Initiative. So I'll turn it over to Vinnie. We'll talk more about the panel, and again, welcome to, to Johns Hopkins, and, and, and thanks so much for, for listening and for coming here today. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, and thanks so much to Johns Hopkins, Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center for hosting uh, the second of our forums on healthcare reform. I think our previous forum did a good job of setting the stage on what all of healthcare reform means, and now we're going to focus on what happens this year. We in Maryland are very pleased and proud that under the leadership of Governor Martin O'Malley, we've expanded healthcare to over 200,000 people in the last three years, dramatically reduced smoking, and made some tremendous public health progress. And now we're prepared to build on that by fully implementing uh, federal reform. And I want to recognize one person in the audience, Dr. Alex Haller from the American Academy of Pediatrics, who's been a strong supporter of everything we've done in our, our broad coalition. Dr. Haller, you are a star. So uh, thank you, Dr. Haller. And we are going to work very hard to fully implement federal reform. And part of fully help implementing federal reform is educating the public. And that's what um, this forum is about. And also, New York's Rosanna Miles and 
Brooke Heisel from, from our staff, who you'll be hearing about, uh, hearing from a lot. And it's my pleasure to introduce two other of our co-sponsors. First is Lenny Preston from the Women's Healthcare Coalition, and she has been a leader in Maryland and in the nation in achieving healthcare uh, for all and fully implemented. Lenny? Thank you, Vinny. It's a pleasure to, to co-sponsor this. The Women's Coalition was formed five years ago because we know that women get things done. Uh, and we're working to ensure that every Marylander has access to health care. Uh, my job is brief. It's to give you three websites. Uh, the Women's Coalition website is mdhealthcarereform.org. We have lots of resources and information there. Uh, speaking of that train that's coming down the track at a rapid pace, um, the Maryland Healthcare Reform Coordinating Council has been extremely active in preparing the track and loading those train cars. And uh, you need, should go and get information about what's going on with them at healthreform.maryland.gov. And the uh, federal site for healthcare reform is simply healthcare.gov. I encourage you to go to all of those. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lenny. And thanks for all the leadership of the Women's Coalition on this issue. It's also my pleasure to introduce Henry Bogdan, who as uh, a leader of the Maryland Association of Nonprofits has been helping small nonprofits like ours stay alive. And he's also been a great leader in the needs of the state for the nonprofit community and for, for the state budget. So uh, we thank him for co-hosting. Henry? Thank you, Vinny. Uh, the Maryland Association of Nonprofits is a statewide association whose, whose mission is to strengthen and educate and engage nonprofits and help them perform their public service missions. The health care issue is, is a critical issue for the people nonprofits serve around the state, for the employees of many nonprofits, and for nonprofit organizations themselves as small employers. So we're very proud to have the opportunity to sponsor this series of forums, to work with the Citizens Health Initiative and the other sponsors, and uh, uh, hopefully you will all learn and we will learn uh, more as this goes forward, and, and we work together to implement health care reform now that we have federal action. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you so much, Henry and Lenny. Another one of our co-sponsors is AARP, and you'll be hearing from Tiffany in a couple minutes. She's on the panel. I want to thank those out in the world who are listening and watching online, including all the way in Garrett County, Maryland. Thank you for listening in. And I want to remind you of our website, healthcareforall.com, where you can find out about what we're doing. And now I want to turn over uh, this, um, this program to uh, Professor uh, Brad Herring. Uh, Dr. Herring and Dr. Jonathan Weiner have been key parts of our technical advisory uh, committee for many years in coming up with our Health Care for All plan and helping us get things done in Maryland. And he did a great job of moderating the June panel, so I'm thrilled to turn it over now to uh, Brad Herring. Brad? Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, everybody, for logging on and joining us uh, here in the auditorium. Um, so as has been mentioned before, a uh, really good uh, panel back in June that talked about all of the elements of healthcare reform, focusing on, uh, some, to some extent, the provisions starting in 2014. Today, switching gears to really focus on the ones that are starting sooner, uh, immediately and, and in the foreseeable future. So we're lucky to have uh, four experts to talk about um, four specific elements um, I'm going to introduce our four speakers now so we can kind of have a seamless transition from one to the next, and then I'll come back to uh, answer, or not answer, to um, provide uh, questions that may come in from uh, those of you online or those of you here in the audience. Okay. So our first speaker is Aaron Smith. He is co-founder and executive director of the Young Invincibles organization. Uh, this was formed in summer of 2009 to really represent uh, kind of an underrepresented group, um, younger people. He's going to be talking about uh, the provisions to increase the age of eligibility for um, adult dependents to be covered on their parents' uh, policies. We'll then transition into uh, having a presentation from Rhett Butler, Buttle uh, from the Small Business Majority, um, manager uh, for National Outreach and Government Affairs. And uh, that presentation will talk about the provisions affecting small businesses and incentives for them to provide coverage. Uh, then we'll transition to our third speaker, Tiffany Lundquist from AARP, the communications director. Uh, she'll be talking about the provisions to uh, close the Medicare Part D donut hole in coverage. And then we'll conclude with uh, Claire McAndrew from Families USA, a health policy analyst there who will try and cover pretty much everything else. <laughs> um, 
So, and again, uh, after that, we uh, hope to leave uh, sufficient time to uh, pose questions to each of our panelists. So uh, with that, let me turn it over to uh, Aaron Smith. And thank you once again for joining us. All right, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, this, my name is Aaron Smith. I'm co-founder and executive director of Young Invincibles. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll be pretty brief. I'm here to talk about coverage up to 26, which as many of you know is one of the first key provisions uh, that expands coverage under the new Affordable Care Act. Um, but maybe I can quickly start by telling a little bit about Young Invincibles since we're a relatively new organization. Um, we got started because Back in the summer of 2009, I was a student at Georgetown Law School, and uh, my friends and I, healthcare was an issue that had personally impacted many of us. I was uninsured after I graduated from college. Many of my friends were as well. Um, and we also knew that for young adults, we're the biggest group of uninsured in the country. There are 21 million uninsured young adults. This was an issue that was incredibly important for our generation, and frankly, there wasn't a lot of voice when it came to for young people in the healthcare debate. Uh, so we decided to start this group. We started a cheap little website, and within a couple weeks, we had hundreds of stories of young people around the country who were sharing why they thought reform was important for them, and it, and it just grew from there. And we focused on youth policies, youth-oriented policies that would really have an impact for our generation, like being able to stay in your parents' plan up to 26. Um, but obviously, there are a host of others, for example, the Medicaid expansion could cover 7 million out of the 21 million uninsured young adults. Uh, but dependent coverage is one that starts right away and uh, one that we're particularly excited about. So um, I mainly want to, I'll, I'll talk about the law quickly, but I also want to share some of the resources that Young Invincibles has put together um, that hopefully uh, you'll find helpful. So as many of you know, uh, the law around dependent coverage really varied from state to state. So some states had no law whatsoever. So generally, young people were dropped off their parents' insurance when they graduated from college or when they turned 19. Uh, Maryland was one of the law was one of the states which fortunately had an expansion up to 25. Um, so that was a very important thing. Uh, and other states, some states went even farther than that. Uh, but Importantly, it's important to rem remember that even when those states had laws, there were certain limitations, and the new, the new law under the Affordable Care Act gets rid of many of those limitations. So for example, in Maryland, you, had, you couldn't be married and be on your parents' plan. You, could, you, you had to be a financial dependent to, to be on your parents' plan. You had to be living at home to be on your parents' plan. None of those restrictions apply anymore. By starting on September 23rd, 2010, uh, the new law took effect. So what that means is that if you're a young adult under the age of 26, you can go back on your parents' plan or stay in your parents' plan um, in, in, in the vast majority of cases. So overall, it's estimated that's going to increase coverage for about 2 million young adults. So what does that mean sort of in the real world? It doesn't mean that you get coverage right on September 23rd. That's an important point. You can You sign up. In during the next open enrollment period. For many companies, your plan year is going to start January 1. So during the open enrollment this late fall, you're going to, your parents will have an opportunity. Uh, if, you're, if you're a parent, you'll have the opportunity to put your child on, on your coverage. Um, and so for most young people, it will probably start around January 1. But this fall is really when you need to know about it and start to think about how you're going to be able to get uh, coverage under the new law. And let me quickly say, to sort of to celebrate this and to create a, more awareness, because a lot of young people simply don't know that this option exists, uh, we did a series of events. Uh, we worked with Vinny and some of the, the other groups up here, uh, Families USA, Small Business Majority, ARP, to have, we had events all across the country, uh, over 80 events in over 25 states to really highlight this provision and talk to young people about how they could now get covered. Uh, so we had events at University of Maryland, we had events at Townsend, um, and 
got a very good response. And so we're, we're optimistic that many young people will take advantage of this, uh, this new option. So let me quickly go over some of the, the resources we have here. So let's see if this works. Um, Young Invincibles created a website called gettingcovered.org, which is basically a central hub for information about dependent coverage. Um, and it's designed to be really consumer friendly and interactive. So if you go to take the quiz, this is the website. Um, and we'll hope it works here. Uh, so you can an you answer a few questions. So I'll take it as a young person. I'm actually not under 26, but let's say I am. Um, do my parents have family coverage? Let's say yes. Does your job offer health insurance? So this is one of the few restrictions in the law. If you have a job that offers you health insurance, there might, you might not be able to get back in your parents' plan, at least until 2014. Um, now that could vary depending on the type of um, employer we're talking about. So generally the rule is if you have a question, the, the first group to talk to is the HR department. Uh, but generally you're going to be able to get on your parents' plan if you're under 26. Um, let's say my job does not. So you get your prescription. You can click on that. And it explains, I can get on my parents' plan. It also gives me some more options. Private insurance, Medicaid, et cetera. Um, so this is a pretty good resource for young people. You can also go on as a parent. So the questions can also, is your adult child under 26, et cetera. Um, so it's a pretty good resource. A nice, a nice thing here is also, um, so many, many parents have a situation where they're facing an employer and they're trying to understand with the employer what does the employer have to do, what, did, what you know, should they do. So we have a section here on both frequently asked questions and know your rights. So here are six wrong reasons for denying coverage that we've been hearing. Um, for example, uh, your child no longer lives with you, therefore they can't get dependent coverage. That's no longer a valid reason not to offer dependent coverage. Um, so let me go back here. So a couple, the, the last thing, I don't want to take too much time here because I know there's questions at the end. We also have a, a tab for employers. Um, and this is designed to actually give employers information about how dependent coverage works because there's actually a fair amount of confusion even on the employer side about whether it applies to them, when do they have to comply, what, it, what kind of notice do they have to give. So we've created this uh, dependent coverage checklist so that employers can, um, can understand how it works for them. And uh, those, are the, those are the main points I want to cover. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions uh, afterwards. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Rhett, Small Business Majority. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Rhett Buttle. I'm the uh, National Outreach and Government Affairs Manager for Small Business Majority. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about our organization, um, but you know, kind of the main idea behind why Small Business Majority was founded and started was really what Aaron was talking about, which is you know that there's just a lot of misinformation and confusion about the law. And so um, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan public po public policy advocacy organization, and we have a national presence. So I'm based in our Washington D.C. office, but we're actually based in California. Um, we also have a presence in Sacramento and New York. And really, we focus on research and advocacy. And when we say small business, um, a lot of folks define small business differently. We define it um, as 100 employees and under. So, and for the last few years, we've really been focused on healthcare. We actually we do work in in other spaces. We work in um, clean energy as well, and access to capital and credit. Um, but over the past few years, uh, kind of as SBM has really gotten started, healthcare has been kind of our main focus because it really has been the number one issue facing employers in terms of cost. 
So I just want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are in the law. Um, I've been asked to talk specifically about the tax credits, and I'll spend the majority of my time talking about those. But I just wanted to cover some things that are in the law, and, and Claire and I were writing down here together. So I said, well, anything that I don't cover in full detail, Claire will clean up. So. Um, so the one thing that I will talk about, like I said, is the, the immediate tax credits that are available for small businesses um, that actually start this year. And, and most small businesses don't know that they're available. So um, across the whole United States, there's about $40 billion in, in tax credits that can be used um, up into 2019. So that's really exciting and, and provides an incentive for small businesses to um, offer health insurance to their employees. Um, provides, obviously, access to a pre-existing condition insurance plan for the self-employed. Um, so Claire will talk actually a little bit more about that. Um, and then establishes a competitive marketplace for small business, um, which many of you have probably heard it's called the exchange. Um, but this is an essential component for small businesses because it really does work off a business concept with the idea that you know the more people who are involved in the exchange, the more we can bring down the cost. And it allows small businesses to pool together to use their you know combined purchasing power to, to drive costs down. So the exchange is really exciting. That will take place in 2014. Um, provide subsidies for small business owners and workers and self-entrepreneurs um, in the law. And so obviously you've heard a lot probably about the elimination of the pre-existing conditions. So this is, this is large for any segment of the population as well as small businesses. Um, there's a grandfather clause, and this is important to many small businesses. So um, you know if your plan does meet um, requirements uh, set forth by Health and Human Services, your plan can be adopted and grandfathered. And you know this is really where we kind of begin you know, systemic cost containment as well. Other immediate benefits that I just wanted to um, brush over as well were um, there's reinsurance program for those from 55 to 64, obviously, before people qualify for Medicare. Um, the bans on dropping insurance coverage for someone who gets sick and grants for small employers to establish wellness programs. So here we really see kind of, you know, an opportunity for small businesses to take the lead in, in investing in people's wellness. And so there's grants in order to help people get started on the path to doing that. And simple cafeteria plans, you know, which offer a lot of tax fee benefits, both for the employer, but also for the employee. Um, and then obviously new innovations, you know, the cut of uh, fraud, waste and abuse and things like that to help bring down the cost and increase access to community health centers. The small business tax credits, um, just going to give kind of the, the broad overview, and obviously, you know, there's there's a lot that goes into this, and I'll be happy to take some of those questions, and, and for those um, that, you know, I can't answer today, I'll follow up with anyone, because um, obviously we're talking about tax policy here, and there's a lot that goes involved. But there are some basic components that I think are really important for small businesses to no. know. These small business tax credits were really created as an incentive to get small businesses who either were about to drop their coverage or those who are considering coverage to really take that plunge and offer health care and coverage. So the really created for the smallest businesses who really need the most help. Um, so it has to be businesses with employees. There's, there's a huge population of the self-employed. There are things for the self-employed. There's about 21 million self-employed in the United States. Um, but these tax credits specifically are focused on businesses who have employees. And so they take uh, effect immediately this year. And so um, you know any of the premiums that have been paid this year will apply towards you know the tax credit. So a lot of folks kind of wondering you know how that works. Things in the past, all of that will apply to this year, 2010. And so the businesses that are eligible are those who have fewer than 25 full-time employees, average annual wages of under 50,000 a year, and the employer must pay at least 50% of the premium cost. This just shows you how many businesses actually qualify for the tax credits. I mean, when we're talking small businesses, we're talking, you know, the apple pie of America, mom and pop, Main Street. Um, so, you know, there's more than 4 million businesses who are actually eligible for the tax credit. And of those, a fourth of those, 1.2 million are actually eligible for the maximum tax credit. Um, so there is, you know, there is great incentive for folks. And, and I think that, you know, Congress decided um, when they decided to include this provision, really put a lot of thought into you know, making sure that there was something there for small business. The tax credits work on a sliding scale. Um, so depending on you know, how much, uh, you know, just because um, you know, you're above a certain wage or you might have more employees in terms of, you, know, you might have 10 full-time employees, but you know, 20 part-time employees. And so it really works on kind of you know, a sliding scale in terms of that. But the part-time employees, the hours are figured out differently. So you could still qualify for the tax credit um, because they're only part-time employees. And so um, for 2010 to 2013, you can actually get up to 35% of the premium 
expenses back what's exciting is in two thousand and fourteen which as we all know is when a lot of the provisions kick in those tax credits actually move up to fifty percent so as you can see we're really creating incentive for small businesses to cover their employees some things that are really important tax credits do not cover premium expenses of the owners and their families and also tax credits cannot be claimed by the self employed which is what i talked to you about in terms of figuring out the actual tax credit the owner actually does not have to put their own information in when they're figuring out you know what they're eligible for generally the owner kind of you know makes the most money as well as their family members are excluded so that allows them to actually achieve more of a tax credit towards their employees premium so this is actually a benefit it it seems to a lot of folks that it might not be but this actually allows them to receive more of a tax credit if they provide insurance to their employees talk a little bit about the Maryland Health Insurance Partnership because one of the exciting things about Maryland that a lot of states don't have is they actually have their own tax credit for small businesses and what's exciting is that um, this this generally does not interfere with the federal tax credit so there's a lot of resources for Maryland small businesses out there in terms of helping them to provide coverage for their employees so subsidies for small businesses obviously to you know help the high cost of premiums and the administrative costs and so um, a, a little bit of a smaller pool in this sense um, so we're looking at very small firms for the Maryland Maryland tax credit between two to nine full-time employees, same um, average wages at 50K. And uh, one of the big rules is they cannot have offered insurance in the past 12 months. Um, and in some of the the things that are required of an employer in order to take advantage of this credit are one that they have a wellness benefit design so that they're you know um, they're investing in wellness which we know you know saves costs in the end if you invest in wellness and obviously that they you know use a section 125 plan which is what I talked a little bit about before and this actually um, allows employers and employees to save um, in terms of taxes so the maximum subsidy um, will be the lower of either two thousand dollars or fifty percent of the premium and uh, the subsidy is actually shared between the employer and the employee um, so that's that's kind of different from the federal tax credit um, and then obviously you know so it's lower premium payments uh, for the employer and then lower payroll deductions for the employee so they both win in this case um, so the state has you know to, to be fiscally responsible the state has capped this at a 15 million dollar um, budget and if you want more information about this um, I know Vinny's group would be happy um, to speak with anyone about it but also you know great great resources are available online or also uh, by phone and it, through the state Maryland partnership um, just in closing just a few resources that a few folks have already mentioned um, obviously the national HHS website healthcare.gov anything and everything you would ever want to know about healthcare is on this website I have to say that you know I think the government has actually done a really excellent job getting as much up as they can in, in a quick time um, and so you know the website is very comprehensive um, for small business owners particularly I'd really encourage you to check out um, our website which is www.smallbusinessmajority.org um, we have a great uh, form that talks about you know the intricate details of what's in healthcare reform for small business goes over a lot of the things that I talked about in depth we have a detailed frequently asked questions website which really kind of delves into the tax policy and answers those difficult questions um, we you know provide small business owners with with monthly newsletters and the reason this is important is because there's a lot of things that are still rolling out about healthcare reform and so we try to keep those things we try to do conference calls and presentations to keep small business owners informed kind of as as you know these things are rolling out so I'd encourage you to get on our newsletter and sign up for our list so you could be a part of those things and then also we have a an amazing tax credit calculator which actually is um, for anyone to use and small businesses in particular it, I would encourage you even if you don't think you qualify for the credit to get on and just plug your numbers into the to the tax credit calculator because it's very it's like a three-step process and it'll let you know what you qualify for it's very easy to use and and we're always available of course to answer any questions if you have questions around that and then just our contact information and um, that's our phone number for our Washington office so feel free to call us there and you can always email us at national at smallbusinessmajority.org and I will take questions and, and turn it over to Tiffany from AARP Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, thank you and good afternoon everyone. My name is Tiffany Lundquist and I'm the Communications Director and Healthcare Outreach Manager for AARP here in the state of Maryland. And AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with a membership of 40 million Americans who are 50 and older. Uh, we have nearly 850,000 members here in the state of Maryland and we were delighted to co-sponsor this uh, forum and a number of other outreach efforts on the new health care law. AARP was founded nearly um, uh, more than 50 years ago, actually 52 years ago, based on the principle of ensuring quality, affordable health care for older Americans especially and for all Americans. And so, so that principle really remains at the core of all that we do at AARP. I have a few minutes here and I've been asked to address um, some of the ways the new health care law uh, changes uh, benefits and uh, programs for seniors, especially in 2010. Um, but I do also want to note that many of the provisions that my fellow panelists are talking about today, especially some of those provisions that affect private insurance regulations, have a great impact on Marylanders and Americans who are 50 and older. Um, half of all small business owners are 50 and older. Um, many, many, uh, in fact, I would guess all of our members care deeply about their children and grandchildren who may be young and invincible. Um, so it's very important to keep in mind the interconnectedness of all of these provisions um, as, we, as we piece it out and talk about our individual parts today. Before I move into uh, Medicare benefits, I do want to touch quickly on one provision of the law that protects those early retirees who are not yet old enough for Medicare. Starting this year, if you have retiree health coverage through your workplace and are between 50, uh, 55 and 65, I'm sorry, 55 and 64 years old, new federal funds will encourage your employer to continue offering that health, health benefit. Um, last year, this would have affected about 71,000 Marylanders, um, and certainly we've all heard the research about the uh, precipitously high rate of drop-off of employers that are uh, continuing to provide health coverage to their retirees. Um, but these new federal funds are intended to encourage those uh, large employers and small employers that are offering coverage uh, to continue to do so, and private and public employers of any size and union-sponsored health plans are eligible to apply for those funds right now. For people who are on Medicare, uh, 65 and older or disabled, the most important thing to know about the new health care law is that your guaranteed traditional Medicare benefits are protected. Um, this includes your doctor and hospital visits under Part A and Part B, uh, your rehab services, those traditional uh, Medicare benefits that, uh, that older Americans have earned and come to depend on are protected under the new health care law. Um, it also starts to greatly improve um, the uh, Part D uh, portion of Medicare, which covers prescription drugs, and lower that out-of-pocket cost that so many of our members and so many older Americans have really been struggling with. Um, for those who uh, might need a quick refresher on the donut hole um, and that, that coverage gap under Part D, um, when people who... Uh, our Medicare beneficiaries have a Part D plan that covers their, uh, their prescription drugs and their total drug expenses uh, through the course of a year reach a certain limit and this year that limit is $2,830 whether they've paid for that or their drug plan has paid for that. When they reach that limit um, they lose all coverage and those individuals um, automatically uh, uh, quite suddenly are paying 100% of the cost of their prescription drugs until they reach the other side of the donut hole and catastrophic coverage kicks in. But very few of the folks who fall into the donut hole ever come out the other side. Um, and there were 63,000 Marylanders last year who fell into that donut hole. So starting this year in 2010, uh, everyone who falls into the donut hole or the coverage gap on Medicare Part D will receive a $250 rebate check from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, the, the important thing to know about that rebate check is that it is triggered automatically. There are no forms to fill out. There is no application. Um, if you receive a call or somebody knocks on your door and says they can help you get the check, if you give them your Medicare number, that's a perfect recipe for identity theft, so please don't do that. Um, it is triggered automatically. You don't need to do anything to receive that except spend enough on your drugs to fall into the donut hole. And um, you should receive that rebate check probably six to eight weeks after you reach that limit. Um, there was a, a notice from um, HHS about a month ago that they had already mailed out a million checks nationwide. Um, so this is certainly having a big, big impact for many older Americans. 
And um, I know we were focusing primarily on, on 2010, but 2011 is just around the corner. It's so close, and it's important to note that starting next year, uh, that $250 rebate check is really just for this year, but starting next year, folks who fall into that donut hole will start to receive a 50% discount on the cost of their brand name drugs um, while they're in the coverage gap, and a 7% discount on those generic issue drugs, and those discounts will gradually uh, grow bigger until the donut hole closes. Um, the final quick topic that I want to touch on um, as, as for how the Affordable Care Act really will help seniors, especially in this year, is for those folks with long-term care needs. And as we all are living longer um, and growing older, um, this is going to be a continuing, continuingly larger portion of the population. Under the new law, people with long-term care needs will be able to get more services to help them live independently and stay in their homes and communities as they age. Um, one of those programs is called the Money Follows the Person Rebalancing Demonstration. Um, this is a program that allows folks who have been in an institutional setting and want to transfer back to their home and community um, to continue to have the, the funding infrastructure to pay for that. Um, the Affordable Care Act continues the existing authority and grant funding for Money Follows the Person um, for, an, for an additional five years. <clears throat> It also reduces the length of time a person is required to reside in an institutional setting before they are eligible to participate, participate in the program from six months to 90 consecutive days. Uh, two weeks ago, the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene announced that it has already been awarded a $397,000 in new grant funding to support work in our state to transition individuals from nursing home care to community-based care through Money Follows the Person. The Maryland Department of Aging has also already been awarded a $500,000 grant under the Affordable Care Act to strengthen options counseling programs, which help people understand and evaluate the full range of long-term care options that are available to them in their community. And finally, federal dollars are now available to states to conduct criminal background checks on employees of long-term care facilities and home-based health care um, organizations who offer direct patient access. Um, and so that's going to be an important provision to make sure that those folks who are providing frontline care are uh, qualified and should be doing so. Um, that's a lot to cover in a short time span, but I know we'll have questions, and I encourage everyone uh, who has questions about how the law affects older Americans um, to visit aarp.org. There's an extensive Q&A section, an extensive um, informational section there on the new health care law um, and how it affects both uh, older Americans who are on Medicare and those uh, 50 and older Americans who might be struggling with pre-existing conditions uh, might have a, a real difficult time on the individual insurance market um, and what's available for them under the new law. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm Claire McAndrew. I'm with Families USA. Um, we're a national, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with the mission of achieving uh, high quality, affordable health care for all Americans. Um, we do a lot of advocacy on the federal level to achieve policies that meet that goal. And we also work a lot with state groups. Um, I think I talk to Vinny at least once a week. So we're very active um, with different state groups that have a similar mission. And so um, I'm going to do a bit of a, an overview and a wrap up of the other issues that are, or the other provisions that go effect, into effect this year. Um, we focus on consumers in general with a special focus on low income consumers. Um, so I'm going to do an overview from that lens. And just to start out, I um, did this little slide of just the Affordable Care Act in a nutshell. We're talking a lot about specific provisions today because they take effect this year. But to do a quick overview, these are four aspects that I think are very major components of the law. Um, of course, the reforms to the private insurance market to put in new consumer protections to help people get coverage that actually works for them. Um, the new exchanges that Rhett mentioned, these are new health insurance marketplaces where consumers can go, they can see all of their options in a transparent way, um, and they might be able, eligible for premium subsidies to help them afford coverage, of course, in 2014. The expansion of the Medicaid program is critical. Um, something that's often not understood about our current Medicaid program is that you're not necessarily eligible just because you have a very low income or no income. Um, there's categories that you have to meet, whether it's being a parent or a child. Um, if you are an adult without a child, you often can't get Medicaid coverage. Maryland tried to address that or did address that through a law that expands the program to adults without children, although funding is pending. So this 
law and the Affordable Care Act will expand the program to 133% of the federal poverty level, which is about, it's $14,403 in 2010. So obviously still a low income level, um, but it's a vast improvement from our world now where you have to also fall in the correct box even if your income is low. So every state will go up to 133% of poverty for the Medicaid program, which is a federal state partnership that provides coverage to low income people. Um, and then of course the Medicare improvements we heard about just now. So I'm going to start with private insurance protections. Um, this is where I focus a lot of my work and it's also um, things that took effect very recently starting on September 23rd. And Aaron explained what that really means, that it's when your plan year starts again on or after September 23rd. So when you have that open enrollment period in your employer coverage, or if you purchase coverage on your own, it might be just the anniversary date of when you bought that policy, um, when your deductible would start over for the year. So that's important to understand. We don't want people being upset because it's after September 23rd and they think that they're not gonna get this protection or um, you know, they're worried that they're not, their rights aren't being enforced. It's good to ask your employer when the plan year starts again. So the first one I wanna touch on is a ban on lifetime limits in coverage. Lifetime limits would say, um, you know, we're only going to cover a million dollars of your care over the course of your life. Once you spend a million and one dollars on health coverage, your policy is basically over. You've run out of coverage and you'd have to go buy a new plan. Or we've heard of people switching jobs because they've hit a lifetime limit in their plan, um, particularly folks with hemophilia who need that expensive um, clotting factor. Um, we've heard of them having to jump jobs to, to get a new policy. So that's no longer going to be happening starting on or after September 23rd. Lifetime coverage limits are no longer per, permitted. Um, annual limits, similar concept except per year. So, you know, uh, $20,000 over the course of, your year, of a year, if you hit that, you basically don't have coverage anymore until the next year comes. These are phased out. So they'll be outright prohibited in 2014, but in the coming year, they can't be any less than $750,000 and it will go up to 1.25 million the next year, then 2 million, and then come 2014, these limits are also prohibited, um, guaranteeing more continuous coverage. The next provision is coverage of recommended preventive services in new health plans. This means newly sold plans. So if you're in the same plan you've been in, unfortunately, um, you know, this won't apply until you may have a new plan. So if um, you buy a new plan on your own from an insurer, this would apply, or if your employer buys a new plan or um, switches carriers, um, Rhett mentioned this. So for new plans, recommended preventive services that are recommended by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and the CDC um, and the Health Resources Services Administration, so different sort of government panels of experts, will be covered without cost sharing. So things like mammograms, vaccines for children, things like that. Um, and then, of course, we've heard about coverage for people up to age 26. And then no discrimination based on pre-existing conditions for children up to age 19. Um, of course, in 2014, all these concerns about pre-existing conditions should be ameliorated. You're no longer allowed to be denied based on your health status. You can't be charged higher premiums. And you can't be sold a policy that says, hey, we'll cover everything except that one thing you really need care for. Um, but some of these protections take effect starting this year for children. Um, they can no longer be turned down for coverage because they have a pre-existing condition and they can no longer be sold a policy that leaves out those important conditions. Um, there has been some struggle with the insurance companies on the interpretation of these protections, how what the law really says they mean. And the resolution, the compromise that's come out is that um, while you cannot be denied based on your pre-existing condition, insurers that are selling just to families or individuals um, can do sort of an open enrollment period. So they might be open to accepting new enrollees for a given period of the year. Maybe it's the first three months. So you have to um, sort of be aware of that. Um, because what we were seeing in some states, unfortunately, was that insurers said, well, we don't want to sell it to kids at all now. And you know that just isn't helpful to anybody. So there may be a certain period of the year. Um, and you know they, they wanted this because they were, they were concerned that people would wait until they got sick to buy a plan. This was the compromise. Um, and frankly, it's a lot better than what we have now, where they could say no um, you know, 365 days a year. Um, so the next protection I'm going to mention, um, Brett also touched on, and that's protections against unfair rescissions. And these are just egregious practices. What happens, um, especially in the individual market where people are buying coverage on their own from an insurer, is usually at a time when an, insurer, um, when an insured patient might file an expensive claim um, that would obviously be expensive for the insurer, they might decide that they want to take a look back into the medical records and see if there's not something that they didn't know about that they can say, um, 
basically they would accuse you of fraud even if it was an honest mistake. So we've heard examples, you know, someone has an expensive claim, they've been in an accident, and they look, the insurer comes to them and says, well, we looked through your records and you didn't tell us about these two doctor's visits you had six years ago with a specialist. And, you know, how do we know that? We never would have sold you this policy because it makes you at risk. Um, and so we're going to revoke your coverage. And we're not just going to cancel it going forward. You owe us. You owe us the money we spent on you because we never would have sold you this. It's very egregious. Um, the problems have been, you know, it's happened more in some states than others, but it's really happened to the most vulnerable people, the sickest people. So the law makes it clear, finally, that this can only happen in cases of fraud when there's a right to appeal the process, when people have an advance notice. So it's more of a, a fair legal process as opposed to at the whim of the insurer leaving a consumer helpless. Um, so it says in the law now that it has to be in cases of fraud and people have a right to a hearing. And that leads me into the next right to internal and external appeals. And this refers to a different situation, but we've all heard of it, when your doctor orders you a service and the insurer says no. And the doctor says, well, my patient needs this, and a fight ensues. So um, now the rights are clear across the states that people first have the right to appeal this decision internally, which means they're appealing with the plan with medical experts that are affiliated with the insurance plan but not involved in this decision. And these do come out in favor of consumers, um, but when they don't, now there's also a right to an external appeal, meaning you um, file for an appeal with an independent review board, and that board um, will make a decision, you know, an unbiased decision. And if they rule in the consumer's favor, the insurer must pay. Um, they, they can't back down on that. And Maryland did have laws similar to this to protect people, but much like the dependent coverage that Aaron described, it didn't apply to everyone. Um, for instance, it doesn't apply to, didn't apply to people in what are called self-insured plans. So large employers, oftentimes, they don't buy really an insurance policy from you know, Blue Cross. They have enough um, money themselves, and they're also across multiple states, that they might really be paying out claims for their employees, even if it's administered through Blue Cross. So before, these plans weren't really subject to state laws because, you know, take IBM. They have an office here. They have an office in Illinois. They have an office in California. So they weren't in, required to comply with every state's laws. But now there will be a federal standard across the board, so patients in those plans will have those rights. Um, regarding emergency care for newly sold plans, insurers can't require prior authorization of an emergency visit, so you don't have to call your insurance plan from the ambulance and tell them you're going to the hospital so that they can authorize payment. Um, also, co-payments and co-insurance would have to be the same whether you go to an emergency facility that's in your plan's network or whether you're out of town and end up in a hospital that's not in the network. So these are protections in newly sold plans. Also in newly sold plans, um, the choice of primary care providers. This refers to a situation when, say, you're in an HMO and the plan says, well, you have to tell us who your primary care provider is. But in some plans, they might have told you who your primary care provider is. And this says that's not acceptable. You have to give patients the right to choose their doctor from those who are available to see new patients. There's also direct access to OBGYNs for women, meaning you can't be required to get a referral, say, from your primary care doctor if you want to go see your OBGYN. Um, this I put into sort of a next category, shifting from the private market protections to new funding that's available this year to start improving our healthcare system. The first I want to mention are grants for consumer assistance programs. These programs, um, they might be based in a nonprofit or they might be based through a state agency, are there to help people navigate the healthcare system. Say someone's in that situation where the insurer said no to a service their doctor ordered, they can work with these agencies who are experts in helping people with this to file those appeals. So there's more funding for those. Um, there's grants for rate review. What that means is when an insurer says next year we need to in our, increase our rates 25%, um, this is funding to help the state insurance departments, state agencies actually review those rates, make sure that they're reasonable, that they're mathematically sound based on the people who they're insuring. You know, is this really representative of what their costs are going to be? Um, so that's an important help there. Then there's grants for states to start working on the exchanges. And I know there's a lot of people in this room who are involved in planning that. In Maryland, the new health insurance marketplaces, um, HHS released funding to help with the planning process and figuring out how states are going to set those up. And then, of course, the provisions we heard about before. And now I'm going to touch on these issues. These areas here are a little bit out of my expertise. I work on health coverage issues, but I just want to stress how much funding there is outside of the coverage realm and how many initiatives there are for public health and prevention and wellness. Um, grant, grant funding for community health centers, the first round was released on Friday, funding to help community health centers with construction, renovation, expanding services. 
There's increased funding for primary care providers in terms of loan repayments, scholarships, um, increased payment rates for rural health care providers, and the creation of a new very large prevention and public health fund that's going to fund numerous initiatives ranging from tobacco cessation, obesity prevention, to laboratories, and um, surveillance and disease tracking. So there's definitely a lot there and um, a lot to be excited about. And then finally, the last things I want to touch on are some actual programs that are starting this year. The first is the pre-existing condition insurance plan, which um, Rhett touched on. And this is available to people who have been uninsured for at least six months who have a pre-existing condition. So in Maryland, this sort of operator does operate alongside the state's existing plan for people with pre-existing conditions, the Maryland Health Insurance Plan, which doesn't require you to go bare and have no insurance for six months. Um, we heard about um, early retiree um, reinsurance for early retiree coverage, and we heard about the web portal, www.healthcare.gov, but I have to bring it up again because it really is amazing, not just because of the information about the law that's there, but because what it allows consumers to do. It allows you to log in, put in your information, and see the plans that are in your area. And we have, we've seen something like this before. We've seen ehealthinsurance.com, which is kind of a travelocity. Um, of healthcare, but this provides you information you can't get there. For instance, you can look and see how many, what percent of people does this plan deny, because until 2014, that can still happen. So you can see that. You can see what percent of claims this, this plan um, does not pay. And I just, we've worked a lot with the folks who are working on this page, and they're very committed not only to making it easily understandable for consumers, but making it a tool that people can use to make sure their rights are enforced, to know what they're getting. Um, and it's only going to grow. It's going to have more information on, on it as the years go by and definitely when the exchanges start. Um, so it really it makes something that can be very difficult for consumers to understand, um, meet their needs, and help them with their rights. Um, the very last thing I want to touch on is the option to expand the Medicaid program early. So I talked about how we're going to be expanding Medicaid across the country to 133% of poverty. Um, and in the past, states couldn't always um, use federal dollars to um, help them cover people up to that high of level unless they went through a process where they got a waiver. Um, and it's, it's possible, but um, it was harder. And so now states can expand who they cover in that program um, without having to go through any extra barriers and they can get the same amount of money from the federal government that they get to cover other people for that population. Um, some states have started doing this already, but most of the states that are doing it because budgets are tight are states that were already covering some populations at that level, but they were using their own money, basically, state money. And now um, those states are going to draw down some federal dollars. But you can talk to Vinny about his thoughts on this, because he truly is the Medicaid expansion expert in Maryland. Um, but it's a good opportunity. Um, but in a tight budget time. So I'm going to stop there, and we're all looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Claire. And thanks to all uh, four of our speakers. Um, so, so we definitely have lots of time for questions. Um, those of you uh, watching this at home can submit them uh, through the website. And uh, those of you here in the auditorium uh, feel free to uh, identify yourself and pose a question. I'm having a hard time seeing because of the lights. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, it's Henry Bob from Mill Nonprofit. Could Red say a word about uh, nonprofit's ability to access the small employer tax credit? Uh, yes, nonprofits actually have the ability to access um, the tax credit as well. Um, their percentage uh, for what they would receive back is not as high, so um, but they can actually access the credit starting this year as well, and it actually will bump up as well um, in 2014 when the exchanges are available. So nonprofits are able to access the credit. Um, the IRS actually just recently uh, released the form for that, um, so if you want more information on that, I'd encourage you to visit the IRS website, or I'd be happy to get you information. Um, but yeah, that's one of the great benefits um, to nonprofits is they can access the credit too. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Dean. Do I have some help? Thanks. Can you? Can anybody give a comment on uh, dental care and eye care? That actually, this reminds me. I should repeat the questions for those of the uh, of you at home. The question related to uh, dental care and eye care and, and the provisions there within. 
Sure, um, I can start and people have anything to add. So obviously right now we didn't get a lot into what benefits are covered because um, starting in 2014, there will be an essential benefits package that plans have to cover in the exchanges and in certain markets outside of the exchanges. Um, for children, those services do have to be covered. Um, whether they are, they don't have to be covered under the federal law though for adults, which is you know something that still needs to be worked on. Um, insurance plans selling in the exchanges though are you know able to offer those types of benefits um, you know at their choosing, and of course there is a demand for them. So we would hope that um, you know people could access those services. But I do think there is continued advocacy to be done around making sure that those um, benefits are included. Do other people want to? Maybe as a follow-up, could you also mention mental health uh, benefits? I mental think there's health. some confusion, yeah, with, okay, with, with there's a parody. Okay, mental health benefits, yeah. um, yes, they did come out um, <laughs> included in the essential benefits package, which has, of course, been a long struggle in general for getting parity and services for mental health. Um, mental health parity, so equal coverage of mental and physical services, is required in the essential benefits package, and in the law it says that mental health and substance abuse services must be included in the essential benefits package, um, which I, I think is very exciting. Other questions? Okay. Uh, well, I guess I'll take my prerogative and, and ask one. Um, Tiffany at ARP, could you, could you talk about the, the changes to the Medicare Advantage program that are, that are coming down the pike? Sure, absolutely. Um, the uh, Medicare Advantage program are the Medicare plans that are sold through private insurers. About 25% of Medicare eligible beneficiaries choose to buy their uh, coverage through Medicare Advantage plan rather than traditional Medicare. Um, it was one of the more controversial aspects of the new law that uh, it will begin to phase down and eventually uh, do away with uh, subsidies that are being paid to these private insurance companies that offer Medicare Advantage plans. Um, on average, uh, the CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, is paying 13 to 14 percent more per beneficiary uh, to the private plans that are offering uh, Advantage plans than they are for um, the folks in traditional Medicare. So those overpayments, those subsidies are going to start to phase down. It doesn't start this year. It doesn't start next year. It's 2012 uh, that those payments are going to start to shrink. And what that's going to mean for the beneficiaries of those plans um, remains to be seen. It's really up to each of the um, individual insurance plans to decide how they might uh, change uh, their benefits or coverage, much as they would every year. Um, those folks who, uh, who have a Medicare Advantage plan know that they receive a letter from their uh, from their uh, insurance company every fall. Um, it's important to take a look at those. It's important to think about how your coverage is changing or not and to make the best decision for you and your family. Um, so I have a, a question from a viewer online. Uh, will there be an asset test for the 133% to the federal poverty line in Maryland Medicaid? Or I guess any Medicaid for that I matter. believe the answer is no, but I actually am not a Medicaid expert, so I'm scared to venture that. <laughs> as far as I know, there are not asset tests permitted, though. We are switching to a new way of calculating income called modified adjusted gross income that's going to be the same way that it is calculated for the new health insurance exchange subsidies. And as far as I know, it's a pure um, modified adjusted gross income, if that can be pure, um, that it will be based on. And um, Dr. Herring, if you are more familiar with it, you can. Not more familiar, but, but I think that's, I think that's, my impression is the same. I think there, there's a lot of variation across states in terms of, you know, asset tests, dis income disregards, mm -hmm. and I think the goal with healthcare reform is to try and get a little more uniform anonymity across, um, across states. Correct, yeah. So I think, I could follow up, but I'm quite confident that's the correct answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lots of lots of things, yeah, still confusing to the to that. the yeah, experts I'm a like ourselves. No, no. <laughs> um, questions here? Okay. Well, I've got another one uh, from an online viewer. Um, does the new law that covers children under their parents' health insurance policy until they are twenty six pertain to military children? Good so, uh, <laughs> so. The answer is that when Congress was working on the Affordable Care Act, they were very, in, they made sure that the TRICARE military insurance was not impacted at all. Uh, so none of the benefits were impacted by the Affordable Care Act. The result of that, though, was some of the provisions that many military families do want, like 
being able to keep their children on up until 26 were not included. So actually Congress is working on fixing that right now um, and there's some good momentum on uh, ex including that benefit up to 26 for military families as well. Maybe I'll uh, take my prerogative to ask another one and, and direct this to uh, to Rhett. Um, so, so uh, questions about how the the new exchanges will uh, affect small businesses kind of abound. Um, California has, I think, has been uh, a state that's been considering whether to introduce an exchange before 2014. Um, can you can you comment on what you're hearing from the from the business community in terms of the the pros and cons of of starting earlier and maybe even as a follow on there's also talk about states having the discretion to keep separate and individual markets separate or pool them together can you share your thoughts on how small business is viewing yeah that i mean i i think um you know unfortunately the short answer is there's a lot of unknown um but i'll expand upon that a little you know i i think probably the majority of us sitting up here would say maybe the most exciting thing about the Affordable Care Act is the creation of the exchange. Um, and it's specifically exciting really for, for the small business community because like I said, it's, you know, they've really been plagued with increasing health care costs as, as have folks in the large business community and, and nonprofits as well. Um, and so literally what it does, like I said, is it you know, allows folks to come together and kind of you know, using their pooled purchasing power to, to drive down cost. Um, and so one of the things that's interesting is obviously, you know, we know that there's things that are very specific to small business that are different for, for larger employers. Most large employers already offer health insurance. Um, obviously, there's a disparity with that with, with smaller employers because of the cost. Um, and so the, the difference about what they need out of the exchanges are quite different. And so there, is a, there are some good arguments to be made that um, actually the, the law establishes, it allows the states to actually set up separate exchanges. Um, the small business exchange would be known as the SHOP exchange, S-H-O-P, Small Business Health Option Program. Um, and so, but some states have actually talked about, as you said, merging the exchanges. And the reason for that is, um, you know, the basic idea of creating more competition. And, you know, if more folks are allowed to be in the exchange, more, you know, it will um, encourage the plans to compete with each other. Um, so I think California at this point actually hasn't made a decision about, you know, where they're going with that. Um, I think there's a lot of kind of conversation ensuing, and I think that, you know, there's a there's good argument to be made in both cases. Um, but, you know, ultimately I think that, um, you know, they'll have to look at kind of the, the benefits for the small business community because there are a lot of um, factors that are very specific to the small business community that a shop exchange specifically for the small business um, community would be able to provide. Um, another question coming in online uh, directed to uh, Tiffany Lundquist at AARP. Tiffany Lundquist mentioned the new donut hole coverage, stating that it covers 50% discount on brand name drugs and 7% discount on generic drugs. Did I hear her correctly? That is true. It begins, uh, those discounts begin in 2011 and gradually increase over the course of the next nine years until the donut hole is completely closed in the year 2020. Uh, another question coming in from online. Um, also, what are the details of the reduced length of stay eligibility for long-term care? Um, I, I, I'm not an expert on long-term care. Um, so I know um, that under the federal law for the Money Follows the Person program, the new law um, reduces that required length of stay. So if you're in an institutional setting and you want to transfer back to home or community-based care, previously you were required to have been institutionalized for six months before you were eligible for Money Follows the Person. Um, the new law reduces that to 90 consecutive days. Um, so you're eligible for Money Follows the Person more quickly. Um, but I know that here in the state of Maryland, um, that program is administered by um, uh, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and they have a, an extensive feature on their website that uh, would probably get into the specifics better than I can. Okay. Any new questions here? Yes, in the back. Uh, the question was, what was the rationale for choosing age 26 for this cutoff point? Uh, I have no idea, actually. <laughs> um, there were, at one point, there were actually two versions in Congress. The, the House version went up to 27th birthday, 
and the Senate version went up to 26th birthday, um, and I, I, I suppose they compromised. Um, but you know, it, it's interesting because some states will go up to 30th birthday, um, and uh, you know, with their own laws. And I haven't really seen a good explanation of why one one year uh, versus another. Um, but it'd be interesting, actually, from a public health standpoint, whether there was some sort of actual difference to justify coverage up to a certain level. But I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems like there's about 30 states that have passed these kind of laws. And so one approach could have been like, well, 25 seem, 26 seem to be about the, the, the median, perhaps. Yeah. So maybe as a follow-on to that, I think that there's, there's um, I think, a fair amount of confusion about, yeah, who this impacts in terms of um, states, states already passing this laws. But I think specifically for people here in Maryland, some people may say, well, gosh, we've already passed a law that covers up to, shoot, I, I forget the age, 25. Um, and, and I think some people think that if they're under 25, this, the, the new federal law doesn't impact them, and I think that's not really the case. Can you can you expand on that? Sure. Um, so there were a few, there were a number of limitations to the state laws, including the Maryland Maryland law. So a big one that Claire mentioned was self-insuring companies were not included. So many big corporations are not uh, are called self-insuring, and so they didn't need to comply with the Maryland law. Um, so right there, you take out a large chunk of the big employers in Maryland who didn't have to go up to 25. Now they do. Um, there, are other, there were also restrictions, for example, you couldn't be married. You couldn't be a 23-year-old married to be on your parents' insurance in Maryland. Now you can. You had to live at home with your parents to qualify for the Maryland insurance. Now you, now you don't have to. Um, and you, don't, you also had to be a financial dependent uh, to qualify for your parents' insurance, but you don't have to anymore. Uh, so it really does open up and take off uh, many of the restrictions that were on the Maryland law. Right. And I just wanted to add, too, with state laws in general, um, like the dependent coverage law or any of the other provisions in the bill, if a state has already sort of reached the point that the law reaches and even goes beyond, this doesn't replace that progress. So if your state goes up to 29 for certain groups, um, you'll have up to 26 for everybody, self-insured, married, et cetera. But then whoever was able to go up to 29 before, they can still go up to 29. So this certainly, the, the law is based on the premise that sort of fits together like a puzzle with state laws so that you're certainly not undoing any progress that a state has made. And I think it's similar, as Rhett described, you know, you can get a small business tax credit from the federal government, but you can also still get your state tax credit. So that was the idea behind the law, to sort of level the playing field across the states, but to let states go above and beyond. And in fact, states can still continue to work to go above and beyond what's passed in this law. If they see needs that still aren't met, they can pass laws that um, ex expand upon the Federal um, Affordable Care Act. The, the, the only other thing I'll add on that is that at our website, gettingcovered.org, we have uh, state by state fact sheets that talk about the impact of dependent coverage for every state and look at the law in each state and how it interacts with the new federal law. There's also statistics, uh, and actually, you have one of them in your, your blue packet for Maryland. Um, on the number of uninsured young adults and the projected number that could get coverage as a result of this provision. So uh, I think it's, I think, I think there are about 140,000 uninsured young adults in that age range in, in Maryland, uh, and many of them could benefit. Cool. A um, couple of questions uh, kind of bundled together here for, for Claire. One question, what cuts are coming to Medicare? Uh, another one, um, how will changes to Medicare affect Medicare Advantage plans? I know you highlighted that, but there's kind of a follow-up question. Will people be able to keep their Medicare Advantage plans, or will they be phased out? So that's a whole lot of question. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to answer them in order. So um, it's very important for people to know. I know there, there has been a lot of talk, um, especially during the legislative debate and even since the law has been passed, about this $500 billion um, that people hearing are going to be cut from Medicare. It's very important for people to know that Medicare's budget is not getting smaller. Um, it will not shrink by even $1. And uh, those $500 billion in savings represent a reduction in the growth rate of the program. So instead of growing by about 6.5% a year, it will grow by about 5% a year. 
Medicare continues to grow and is, uh, and is uh, funded. Um, it's important to say that the way to save Medicare and strengthen the program and ensure solvency is really not to be spending more money on it, but to find those ways that we can strengthen the care that's offered um, and, and find savings. So, um, so uh, what's, you know, where is that money coming from is the next question, and there are a lot of ways to answer that. Um, one of the places that money is going to come from is reducing those overpayments to the Medicare Advantage plans, as I discussed earlier. Um, uh, some of the other initiatives that we haven't discussed today um, that attempt to really um, uh, provide uh, better quality care for Medicare beneficiaries, um, some of the preventive and wellness benefits that will save uh, chronic care uh, costs in the long term. Um, some of those other areas are where those savings are going to be found. Um, there is a premium increase for Medicare beneficiaries who make more than $85,000 uh, as individuals a year or $170,000 a year if you're a married couple. Um, that's about 5% of Medicare beneficiaries who will see their premiums increase slightly. Um, Second to the Medicare Advantage question, which I did touch on earlier as far as uh, reducing those overpayments, what I forgot to mention was that there are also going to be funds available to um, reward those Medicare Advantage plans that can demonstrate that they're providing quality care to their beneficiaries. Um, CMS does have a rating system for plans, and those that can demonstrate um, that they're providing quality benefits and quality care um, will be eligible to, um, to receive uh, incentive payments and rewards. So really, um, starting to kind of turn the tide away from that fee-for-service model and more towards whole patient um, quality care uh, under the new law. And was there a third part that I've forgotten? Um, no, no, I think, uh, no, I like think it was a question about part. the Medicare Advantage plans phasing yeah. out. Oh, yeah, and, and again, as far as Medicare Advantage plans phasing out, that's, you know, those are going to be decisions that are made by individual insurance companies. Um, you know, there, there is some balance with, uh, with those rewards um, that uh, offer incentive for quality care um, that should really incentivize the private insurance companies um, to continue to offer those plans where they can do so uh, with good quality care for, care for beneficiaries. Okay. So uh, getting a flurry of questions online, this is great. Um, so another next question. Um, is there an administrative structure for new exchanges? Will consumers be a part of that? Well, the, so the way the exchanges work, um, each state is required to have an exchange. And the design of them is to be sort of state run, but if in a state, the state either feels they don't have the capacity to set one up or um, they're not really interested in doing so, there will be um, an HHS run exchange set up for residents of that state. And the details of that federal run exchange are still very fuzzy. We don't know how that's going to work. But um, the law does say that consumer stakeholders have to be involved in the planning process and in the um, operations of the exchange. It even goes so far to say that you have to involve um, experts who know how to enroll hard to reach populations and coverage involved in your planning process. And states, as I mentioned, were able to apply for and receive planning grants um, that just went out at the end of September. And they were asked to actually describe in the applications for those grants how they're going to involve stakeholders. And I think we might want to see if anyone from Maryland wants to touch on the process here and the involvement of consumers. Or... Well, I, can, I, I don't know in great detail, but I, I know that uh, the Maryland Healthcare Coordinating Council um, has a work group that is dedicated to uh, structuring the exchange here in Maryland, uh, answering those policy questions about how best to serve consumers um, on the exchange, and they uh, have been taking public comment um, as they go through their process. I don't know off the top of my head what their timeline or deadlines were or might still be for public comment, but I know it's available online through the state um, healthcare website. Right. And Vidi can probably tell you more about that because he's provided useful comments in that process. Okay. Questions here? Don't want to ignore our participants here? Okay. Well, got, like I said, got a flurry from online. Um, with the expansions and restrict, this is from an online uh, viewer. With expansions and restrictions on insurance, we expect this to make premiums more expensive. Uh, what will be the best option for small businesses and individuals? Well, there's a lot in the law actually to hold down the cost of premiums. The idea of the law is to make premiums um, you know, good value for your money. So there's a few different requirements um, to do that. One of them. It, relates to the rate review grants I mentioned before, giving insurance departments more capacity to actually take a look at what insurers are proposing in terms of increasing their premiums. And I've talked to some um, insurance commissioners about this. For instance, you might have heard, um, I talked to Commissioner Kohler from Rhode Island about how, you know, a lot of states we hear insurers saying, well, we had to increase our rates 8% because of this health reform law. 
um, he actually had the capacity to study um, the effects of the health reform law that these new provisions that passed and found that the increase was more around 2% um, related to these new protections for which you're getting preventative benefits and all these other things. So I think it's sort of, it's going to be hard to, to know a little bit how much is, you know, the cost of new benefits or as a scapegoat for this law. But again, to get back to the protections in the law to hold rates down, we have rate review where insurance, insurance departments are allowed to look closer at the premiums and figure out when they're justified. We have new medical loss ratio requirements fancy way for saying how much of this money do you actually spend on delivering care. Um, those take effect a little bit later, but starting in 2011, um, insurers in the individual market where you're selling directly to a, a family or a person um, would have to spend um, at least 85%, or I'm sorry, 80% of the premium dollars they collect on actually delivering care and improving quality. Um, same for the small group insurance market where they sell to small businesses. And then for large employers, that standard is set at 85% to make sure that consumers are actually getting value for their do dollars as opposed to, you know, overhead, administration, things like that. Um, so then, I mean, of course, Rhett touched on the idea of exchanges as being a transparent marketplace to encourage competition and keep premiums lower. And then also just an important thing to recognize is that people are going to be getting assistance paying for coverage. People up to 400% of the poverty level um, which I believe is about 80000 for a family of four, are going to be receiving subsidies because, frankly, coverage just, it's not affordable for people. And we are going to see the cost curve go down in years to come. But, I mean, we, we all know how the world works. You can't, you know, the next day premiums are here and they're not going to shoot down. Um, but there is going to be assistance to help people afford that coverage. And this is a broad area, so I don't know if others want yeah. to touch on it. Uh, just on the small business piece, you know, I just want to reemphasize the, the benefits of the exchange um, because, you know, right now, uh, larger corporations, which I also understand, you know, their rates are rising as well, but they're able to spread the risk amongst a lot larger pool of employees where a small business may be, you know, up to 10 or 25 people. It's a lot smaller. Um, so, you know, the idea of the exchange is, you know, allowing them to come in um, and, and really what it does, too, is it, it actually, in a lot of ways, removes kind of the middleman between the small business, um, you know, so they'll have direct access to the exchange. Um, and it was kind of like Claire was talking about, you know, they'll be able to get on to see the different plans. And what that type of transparency does is it forces the insurers to compete with each other, um, you know, to, to make sure that the consumer, in this case a small business or, or even an individual, you know, make sure that they're getting the best cost um, for the type of plan that they want to offer to their employees. Got an online question that's uh, pretty short and sweet that I'll maybe expand upon a little bit. Um, why won't docs take Medicare cards? Um, and perhaps maybe one expansion is why won't docs take uh, Medicaid cards? And uh, the follow one might be what's in this healthcare reform to, to perhaps address that situation? Well, I will um, be happy to speak to the Medicare part of the question mm -hmm. and then uh, toss uh, to some of my fellow panelists. Um, definitely a very serious issue that we hear about from older. Americans and from our members all the time, this issue of access to doctors um, and doctors not accepting new Medicare patients. Um, the biggest part of that is the way Medicare pays its doctors, which is known as the sustainable growth rate and which was not addressed under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the sustainable growth rate is frankly not sustainable. It is um, the formula uh, which leads to uh, what is now an annual right during which we hear um, alarm bells every year that Medicare is going to cut doctors' pay by 21 or 23 or 25 percent, and doctors react by saying they're not going to take Medicare patients anymore, um, understandably, and then Congress uh, steps up and puts together a one or two year patch to make sure that that pay cut doesn't happen. The sustainable growth rate has yet to be fixed in any long-term um, sustainable way, and as Claire was saying earlier, there's still a lot of advocacy work to be done on health care. Um, in America, and so that uh, that issue of paying Medicare doctors fairly um, to ensure uh, beneficiary access um, it remains at the top of AARP's priority list. That being said, there are some provisions under the Affordable Care Act that do uh, attempt to address some access issues. There are incentive payments, um, bonus payments to doctors and hospitals that provide care in rural areas of the country, um, and that will make a big difference. Um, and there are incentive payments uh, uh, structured to um, incentivize doctors to specialize in primary care. A lot of the reason uh, Medicare patients can't find, prim uh, can't find um, doctors is that uh, so many students are, are opting to go into the more lucrative specialties um, rather than primary care um, and see those Medicare patients. So there are some attempts to start to um, develop the workforce more um, 
and, uh, and address it that way. I also know that here in the state of Maryland, last year the General Assembly passed a law greatly expanding um, the authority of nurse practitioners to provide that primary care treatment, um, which will uh, certainly help Medicare beneficiaries receive um, the medical care that they need, especially in some of the rural parts of the state. And I'll speak briefly about Medicaid, although again, I'm not a Medicaid expert, but I mean, the Medicaid program is jointly funded by the federal government and the states. And the state <laughs> budgets right now are very tight. And so when you're faced with a budget crisis and you're thinking about the Medicaid program, where can you cut? You can't cut eligibility anymore, which is good. You can't drop off the income levels you're serving because that's a provision in the Affordable Care Act. Do you want to cut benefits to your, you know, enrollees? Well, you don't. And so oftentimes, you know, you're looking at provider rates. Do we increase provider rates this year or not, given our budget climate? Um, so that's sort of the, the reality right now. The good thing is there are things in the health reform law that attempt to address this. They're very similar or are the same things that Tiffany described. Specifically to the Medicaid program, there's an increase in the rate that primary care providers will be provi um, paid. But also there's a few things I touched on just regarding increasing um, providers in underserved areas, incentives for folks to go there, um, rural areas that actually, of course, do have a lot of um, low income folks who are in the Medicaid program. So I do think this is an area, though, where further work will be continued because, again, it's that sort of struggle between we want to offer great benefits, we want to offer um, good eligibility, but of course you need the providers there to provide the services to people and advocacy needs to be done on all ends. And I know across the country I think this law is bringing the consumer advocates together with the doctors groups to try and come together and continue the advocacy strategy to make the program work for people. Got another question here. Um, any comments on access for adults over 50 years old with pre-existing conditions and accessibility to access to care, um, specifically in regards to being laid off from a job? Right. So I guess the stimulus had some provisions uh, for COBRA coverage. Yeah, What's the stimulus the had a great COBRA subsidy that is now um, not available to newly laid off people because it expired and was not renewed, unfortunately, despite, I know, our best efforts. Um, people, of course, are still able to purchase COBRA coverage. Um, it's, it's not incredibly cheap, but it often is the best option because you know you're getting a comprehensive benefit package. In fact, you're getting the same package you had while you were at work. Um, and then people become eligible for HIPAA coverage. So you exhaust your COBRA and you're guaranteed, that just means you're guaranteed the right to buy a policy. You can't be turned down because of a pre-existing condition because you've maintained coverage. That too is quite expensive. So your other options, until 2014, when we finally have um, availability for everybody to buy coverage through the exchange, your other options right now are the Maryland Health Insurance Plan, which is the state's high-risk pool, the new pre-existing condition insurance plan, which does require you to go bare. And this is something that, that we really fought for. We wanted the rule to be, um, you know, if you've stayed in COBRA and you, then you've maintained this coverage, you've done the right thing, you should be allowed to go in this pool. Unfortunately, that's not what the law said, so we can't stretch it to that point. Um, but that is an option for people. Um, some people might also be Medicaid eligible. And then um, starting in 2014, again, we don't have any more of this pre-existing condition business. If you've lost your job and you want to buy coverage through the exchange, you will be um, legally have that right. Okay. I think we've got uh, time for maybe one more question, which um, I'll actually compact to. They're very similar, and I'll direct them to Rhett. Um, one question, I guess, kind of asking for clarification on this, you know, the rules about uh, coverage for people under 26. Um, here's one. If a young adult in Maryland has an employer that offers coverage, um, can get on their parents' plan, or sorry, if a young adult in Maryland has an employer that offers coverage, can they, uh, he or she, get on their parents' plan if it's a better deal for them? And then the, another one similar seems to be, um, what if you are under 25 and you can receive health benefits um, from your employer, but you can't afford the rates. Is there a plan under the new health care law for this? So uh, the, the, this is, it's not an easy answer, unfortunately. Uh, it really depends on what kind of plan uh, you're dealing with. If it's, a, if it's what's called a grandfather plan, so it's a plan that existed when health care passed, then that employer doesn't have to allow a dependent child on if they have an offer of insurance through their own job. Um, now, again, that there's you have to you have to look at what kind of insurance that job is is offering you. Whether it's um, you know there are some sometimes employers will offer you something that's not truly insurance that might not count against you, um, but 
the, the easiest thing to do is to talk to uh, your parent's employer or if you're a parent to talk to your employer to see how they're addressing it and where where they fit under the law. Um, but by 2014, it won't matter uh, what situ you know whether your child has an offer of insurance. They'll still be able to stay in your parents' plan until uh, 26. Cool. Well, thank you very much. I think this uh, gets us to the end of the session. Um, please uh, join me in thanking Aaron Smith, Brett Buttle, Tiffany Lundquist, and Clara McAndrew. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Oh.